Thanks, Diane. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I work a lot, as you know, Diane outlined in my bio, worked a lot on mobile and social media. And kind of, I'm trained actually, I actually also went to Annenberg for undergrad. I'm trained as a print journalist and in creative writing, but I've spent most of my career doing a lot of uh, micro content, short form storytelling. And I teach uh, native social media storytelling right now at USC. And so I'm just gonna go over really quickly um, in the 10 minutes, uh, some uh, broad, outline, broad outlines of specific strategies that I enforce with my students and that I've practiced in the industry. And then I'm going to uh, give a little uh, heads up on a few trends that I'm looking at and how I'm looking at the future of storytelling. So the biggest, one of the biggest things is thinking about um, utility versus a, a more elevated narrative experience. For a long time now, uh, digital storytellers have been talking about you know, commodity content and you know, the 500 word story that you can get a lot of different places and you're not seeing a lot of engagement with that overall online. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's obviously a lot of short form on native social media with tweets and in apps and push alerts and whatnot, but you're even seeing this in more traditional stories as well. So on the left here, I've um, highlighted Axios. Does anyone recognize this or familiar with the outlet Axios? <coughs> okay, yeah. So um, they actually, this is like around their one year anniversary, they actually launched about a year ago with some Politico alums. And they do a lot of, you know, traditional Washington reporting, but they do it in this quick bullet point like format where it's a few, one or a few graphs, you know, the lead, and then some why it matters, um, what this means going forward. Uh, they have a, another thing called be smart. You know, they have these little tags that they use and they're just quick breakdowns of the information you really need to know versus say sometimes when you're reading about the same subject um, in the New York Times or the Washington Post, it's a longer, you know, 800 to 1,000 word story that sometimes is a little unnecessary. So you're seeing it, I want, I guess I'm trying to encourage you to think, what am I trying to communicate with my content and can it be short and snappy or is it a longer elevated experience, which will be true for a lot of you a lot of the time, I think. So on the other side, I have this um, screenshot of My Family's Slave. Did anyone read that in the Atlantic last year? Yeah. So, you know, it's everyone, you know, sometimes when I'm teaching these concepts, it's like, oh, where, what's happened to long form, the death of long form or whatever. And I was a mobile editor for years. And let me tell you, um, long form content, you still get tons of engagement with that on mobile. It's not that people don't want these experiences. You just have to identify when that's the right experience. So My Family Slave was the Atlantic's most read piece in 2017. So there is this audience out there. But try to, th it's not that it can only has to be one or the other, but there's a lot of different ways to think about communicating the vital information. And sometimes it's just gonna be quick and short, and sometimes you need, you're gonna take this elevated approach. Uh, the other thing that I'm really big on, and what <coughs> my class, my current class that I'm teaching really covers, and that we do in the Media Center, is we think about the content being native to the platform. And this basically means that you know, social media and other places aren't just a way to promote the content. Uh, they are storytelling vehicles in, in themselves. So um, the screenshot on the left is one of my favorite examples of a longer narrative being native to a chat platform, which in this case, it's Viber. Um, and it's a story about a kidnapping. And they created, as you can see, they created uh, different characters within the chat app with different avatars and they had uh, they also had a narrator as the B this was by the BBC and they told this story through chat um, as if it, the kid the the events in the story were happening in real time so if something if something happened at 401 p.m. you'd get a chat at that time and it was told progressively as the events played out in real time so that was a really creative use of being native to the platform for chat with a longer form story. And then um, native to the platform has really been driven a lot by um, Snapchat and Snapchat stories, which is that format is now being replicated across basically every social network now. <laughs> if you're familiar with Instagram stories or Facebook stories, or it's like I, I can barely name a social network where it doesn't exist. But I think part of why this native to the platform really caught on 
It's a lot of reasons, but one of them is when Snapchat started to become more popular and you couldn't share outside of Snapchat. So people started hiring whole teams, like newsrooms hire eight, 10 person, 15 person teams just to create content on Snapchat. So, um, and you're, again, you're seeing this replicate across platforms and you really can't you know, post your link in an Instagram story. You actually, you can do links now, but you need to have something native there. Um, so you're seeing this uh, proliferate as well. And then speaking of Snapchat and this stories format, um, something else that is really engaging across platforms on social when you are being native to the platform is um, visuals really, really rule the day. You're gonna get, the numbers just prove out that you're gonna get more engagement with visuals. I very much caution you not to take this too far. I um, use examples in my classes where I can tell from you know looking at local news organizations. I'm a I'm a big Twitter person. I have TweetDeck if any of you're familiar with that, and I have a news a local news list. And oftentimes I see um, tweets go by from local news orgs where I can tell up oh, somebody in your social media department told you tweets with photos get more engagement, and they add a meaningless photo, a graphic, or something that doesn't really enhance the story uh, to the tweet. So I encourage you to gather compelling visuals whenever possible, but again, I, I didn't just say visuals, I said compelling. Make it count, make it part of the storytelling. Um, if you wanna look at great examples of visual storytelling in the stories format, I recommend following CNN, um, which is what's screenshotted here, the New York Times and the Guardian on Instagram and looking at their stories. I think they're doing a great job with a lot of really good, compelling stories. And then this other example is just to show you that did anyone listen to the S-Town podcast by the serial creators? Um, it came out in March of 2017, and it's a podcast, right? It's radio. But they hired an illustrator to do this wonderful artwork that they had on their website and that they distributed on social. So I think it just demonstrates how important visuals are to this distributed storytelling on the web. And so here, like I said, are a few things I'm, I have my, well, it's really one broad thing in many different forms that I'm, I have my eye on right now. Um, I've been thinking and I've been thinking and doing some, a lot about and doing some things with um, chat and not quite AI, which is to say artificial intelligence, but that's where things are headed. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, one, like chat apps, and you can see the uh, this is an example from the New York Times Politics did um, an account on Facebook Messenger before the 2016 election, and you can see they had a reporter do it. They also do tweets around the, or sorry, uh, texts around the Olympics. They did it in 2016. I think they're going to do it next, uh, yeah, next month. It's still January. Uh, next month in, in South Korea. And they have reporters who are kind of chatting with you to deliver you news updates. Um, right now, the conversation is very guided. It's not, you're not freeform typing and getting an answer from AI. It's very, it's reporter input. It's uh, reporter told stories and it's predetermined, but it's uh, still practicing telling for it stories in this format. Um, and uh, this is, this right here is a bot we actually built in the media center on Slack, if any of you are familiar with that, and it's a copy editing bot. And it's been a really interesting experiment for us to try to anticipate the kinds of questions people are gonna have and try to come up with effective answers in that conversational <coughs> format. And the reason these experiments are important to me now is because some futurist, or one at least, that was at a conference I was at last, uh, last semester said that uh, we might be in for a zero UI future, which is to say no user, no visual user interface. Like if you think about Alexa and Siri and things like that and delivering news on those platforms. So when you, like I, I actually wrote a piece for um, Neiman Lab, which is a publication out of Harvard. Uh, they ask people to do predictions for the upcoming year at the end of every year. So my December 2017 prediction for 2018 was called uh, writing answers before you know the question which I think is something we have to prepare for in this possible zero UI future. You have to deliver an effective answer in uh, when somebody is actually trying to have a verbal conversation um, before you know what exactly they're gonna be asking. You can ask a question in many different ways. Um, like, for, like here, with do I have to put periods in IRS, 
Um, you, could, you could just say IRS or how do I format IRS or all these different things. And one of the things that I've discovered in the short time I've been working on this bot is, you know, you can't assume any one question when you're writing your answer. So that's something I'm thinking about and working on and encourage you to find a way to experiment with it too. That's it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I come from Italy, I'm uh, Rossella Gambetti, and uh, I'm here as a visiting scholar just for, unfortunately, for a short period. I'm doing research on consumer culture with Professor Cosinets, who unfortunately is not here today. And I had the opportunity to present uh, and to do this presentation, which I think I can maybe add some interesting insights for you, because I work in a very uh, Catholic, in a Catholic university in Milan, which is very, strictly religious based uh, and so very rigorous and so I have this kind of perspective both as a scholar and as a Catholic and working for a, uh, for a Catholic uh, religious institution which is uh, my university that maybe uh, can add a little bit to this debate. What we're going to talk today uh, about uh, is a, uh, what I, uh, we thought as a shift in perspective in religious discourse which is very much rooted in some important cultural changes, cultural and ethical issues that are going on uh, in the um, religious institutions debate uh, and uh, discourse uh, with people. These kind of cultural changes are really <coughs> affecting also how transmedia narratives and the kind of storytelling that religious institutions are uh, carrying out to talk to people, to try to evangelize people, uh, um, are, are taking place uh, uh, exactly because of these cultural changes. Especially there are some cues uh, that related to cultural changes uh, are uh, about uh, understanding also the tension between desacralizing, which occurs uh, for the secularization process of uh, religion that is uh, actually going on in this current society, and evangelizing. So we're going to talk a little bit about all, all that. I'm going to start with a chart just to give you an idea that what happened in 2017 as regards the attendance of organized religious services on the part of people. We have a breakdown of the, the different religious groups, and as you can see from the slide, actually is a little bit disappointing the fact that uh, except for just uh, two or three religious groups like I would say Mormons, uh, I would say Jehovah's Witness uh, and Evangelical Protestant, usually the uh, attendance is like once or twice a month uh, or <coughs> a few times a year, which is not exactly encouraging as, a, as data in general. As a matter of fact, religious institutions are <coughs> understanding that they need to change, they need to be better <coughs> embedded in the ca social cultural vibe of this current society in a way that makes more sense for people than to get, and to, they get to church and to attend to uh, religious uh, uh, events uh, in, in general. So let me just briefly introduce to you uh, the transmedia environment we are living in because it impacts a lot from an infrastructural standpoint how religious discourse and religious storytelling is going on today. Well, transmedia environment is composed of uh, uh, a plethora of different platforms of communication, both traditional and digital. The traditional ones, we all know what, what they are because they are typical one-to-many kind of communication forms that happen to be conveyed from TV, from billboard, from prints, from all the traditional media, and are basically aimed at reaching visibility and getting visibility for the corporations that are doing and that are using and owning this media. Whereas on the other side, we have all the plethora of digital media which are user generated, which are many to many, and which are definitely participative. Well, the combination of this uh, different kind of media and the whole body of messaging that is going on, swinging back and forth from traditional to digital, and then again back and forth, is composing what is a transmedia environment. And according to that, of course, uh, branding strategies, transmedia branding, is like considering the whole <coughs> dynamic messaging which accounts for the storytelling and story sharing capacity of all the platforms and, act for, and actors uh, uh, that are uh, considered in this <coughs> ecosystem of different media. This is just to give you an I another uh, idea of how they split. I mean, we have the traditional and own media, which, uh, as I said before, are going to obtain uh, visibility and awareness and to increase the awareness of the corporations that are using them. And on the other side, we have hy hybrid and social media that are based on providing relevant content, also because they are based on user-generated media that are relevant for their very nature because they are produced by people. And so in this case, they are typically work many to, as a, in a many-to-many -many way. 
Having said that, and going back to religion, uh, we can say, and very, I'm very glad to say that because uh, here we are in, a, in an, ex an excellent school as regards uh, journalism and public relations, is that we are, is that, uh, we are having, uh, and we are living in a period in which we, c which we can call like a PR turn uh, of religious discourse. Why? Because religion is becoming less about the preacher in the pulpit and much more about dialogue and two-way communications. What it all means, and this is promise is the last <laughs> conceptual slide, then we go and make sense, of course, of cultural <laughs> things, <laughs> and also uh, the, the transmedia storytelling. Anyway, we, uh, we all know probably this two-step flow of communication um, um, diagram, which is uh, very much based on previous concepts uh, uh, introduced by Katz and Lazarsfeld, two media, two media <coughs> theorists, uh, very famous in the, 19th, in the 1960s. This model basically says that uh, mass media communicate uh, in a way that is not directly reaching the audience because communication is mediated by opinion leaders. Well, bringing this concept today in this transmedia environment means, uh, and is even more emphasized, that these opinion leaders are really empowered today. There are a plethora of online influencers, micro-influencers, that are ordinary people that are so much empowered by the crowd of their followers to assemble, assemble, reassemble, and disembed, re-embed, and uh, choose, uh, pick up, uh, and expand on contents online. They create like a body of knowledge which is really dynamic, which is continuously reproduced in connectivity, in interconnectivity, in network environment, and which really represents something that creates a new body of knowledge. And religious institutions know that uh, and have to face that <coughs> also because these influence influencers uh, are very important in uh, exactly in uh, uh, influencing public opinion of worshippers and uh, of other people in religious debates. Well, apart from the infrastructural standpoint, we have very important, as I told before, uh, cultural changes that are going on today. There, is, there was a very interesting research carried out by uh, an American researcher uh, Christian Smith of the University of North Carolina some years ago that uh, was about understanding teenagers' perception of faith, of, be of religious beliefs uh, in, these, uh, in these days, especially millennials. And he came out with a concept which is very interesting to me, which is the moralistic therapeutic deism, which is a kind of new belief uh, that really secularizes the, uh, let's say, the religious credo in a way that makes the religious credo for teenagers for the younger generation much more down to earth, much more embedded in their social cultural vibe, much more embedded in their lifestyle. That means that religion, religious debate today, religious faith is more related to understanding the pragmatic conditions of lifestyle and so helping the individual to enhance his potential, to fight against his fears, to fight against his anger, to fight against the, all the kind of psychological problems that he may face during his lifetime, and also it's more about, not only that, but also more concerned about the charitable and moral and, uh, let's say, ethical aspect of the Bible, much more than glorifying <coughs> gods or talking about dogmas which are very difficult to grasp. But especially what I found very interesting is that this kind of religious credo, which is more secularized, is also related to enhance what is called the eudaimonic well-being quest of individuals which very much complement, according to Aristotelic tradition, the hedonic uh, kind of well-being, uh, which has always been emphasized, and I'm coming from the consumer culture theory kind of background, and I can say that usually it's all about understanding hedonic consumption, hedonic pleasure, but nowadays the eudaimonic dimension, which is about finding purpose in life, which is about finding, contributing to the greater good, but at a, soci at a social cultural level, not at, a, an, a, at an interpersonal level, not just at, at an intrapsychic uh, level, is absolutely very important. So this eudaimonic well-being is much related to how religion actually can help people find their own dimension, doing good and doing fair in the society as a whole. So that's about what, what <coughs> usually people think, especially young people who want to to have from religion. And they are also looking to have like a personalized religion experience exactly as it happens with consumption and with uh, the relationship they have with products and brands. Because uh, as uh, <coughs> uh, Reverend Pete Phillips said recently, millennials are people that actually prefer the figure of God, for example, to the figure of Jesus Christ. That is amazing uh, uh, from a certain standpoint. You wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine that. 
But why do they prefer this? Because they perceive God as more detached, let's say, more like a guide, more like a mentor, <coughs> exactly that enable them to perceive uh, uh, their own lives as they like, to live their own lives as they want. They want to be and to feel independent, and they want the figure of God just to be a guide which <coughs> from above guides them and inspires them, but not too much a figure like Jesus Christ, which is much more intrusive in a certain sense, and basically is much more participative in their life. So that's how it works uh, for millennials. Now I'm going to uh, transfer these kind of cultural elements of secularization into some, I would say, controversial, that I chose on purpose to be controversial, aspects of a religious storytelling, which is quite fun from a certain standpoint, but also very interesting to analyze, to understand how culture fits today with the, the religious debate and religious storytelling. The first example is what I called the shifting Bible, <coughs> because from being considered like an unmovable word of God, which is strict, which is obviously rigorous, which is un unchanged, thanks to a app, an app that is called YouVersion, now you can download your own verses of the Bible for any purpose, according to a pick and choose logic, which is quite commercial and also mediated by influentials. But that means that you have your own word of God wherever you are, and I really mean it, wherever you are. <laughs> so, and I don't want to go further on that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, what it means basically is uh, that we have positive points and neg and, neg and let's say some drawbacks. The positive aspects are related to the fact that basically <coughs> you, we were talking about before about this personalized experience that people are, are looking for. Well, in uh, picking up and choose your own verses, the one that bought the best fit with your lifestyle, you, are, you have like a more, let's say, personal, spiritual path that you are building up. And also it's not like staying, uh, uh, like, set, uh, like sitting down at mass and just listening to the priest uh, doing the sermon, because uh, in this sense uh, you are more participative because you choose your own contents that best represent you. On the other side, uh, the drawback uh, is related to the fact that, of course, like everything, every content is mediated by influentials. The, uh, the kind of, I mean, the most uh, downloaded uh, verses of the Bible are uh, subject to popularity contests that are based on <coughs> ranking, on likings, uh, on uh, how cool is the influential that suggested them, and uh, everything like this. This is really trivializing a little bit, uh, I would say, the, the contents, of course, of the, of the verses of the Bible. Another example which is even more fun, and, and being Catholic I know that because there are really a lot of discourse going on on digital memes, uh, and uh, I would say that this is really raises question about desacralizing or evangelizing using memes. I mean, people expect at a general level from all kind of institutions a self-ironic attitude today, from politics, uh, from families, from every, everything that is going on in our world. Of course, religious institutions are not an, are not an exception. So digital memes uh, also bring, can bring religion closer to people because it's not just mocking about religion, it's not just teasing about uh, everything that is sacred, but it's also an opportunity for the church, it's also an opportunity exactly to be more embedded in the cultural lifestyle. And also people can use digital memes storytelling to provoke debate and to affirm beliefs. And also and on top of that, uh, there are some kind of theological truth that can be really difficult to grasp because they're too abstract, too philosophical, that can be, let's say, of course trivialized, but also summarized in a very uh, effective way uh, using memes, using uh, short catchphrases like teasers. And so <coughs> this, uh, this is another opportunity to, I mean, to consider a cultural phenomenon from a positive perspective. This is another example I'm, I'm very proud of because uh, it's uh, purely Italian and it's very <laughs> controversial <laughs> also. <laughs> we had this series going on uh, from 2016, 2017, made by our director Paolo Sorrentino, which is called the Young Pope, probably you've seen it. And uh, it was about a very secular Pope, uh, I mean, which is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, which, uh, um, Lenny Bellardo, uh, that was, uh, of course, uh, starring uh, Jude Law. Uh, who is a pope uh, that actually uh, not only has a secular kind of, uh, of habits, uh, but also has a very turbulent personal relationship with God. So it's a very uh, controversial character. But th this is part of a trend, again, of transmedia trend of uh, uh, digital story, of sto religious storytelling that is about celebrating religious leaders as they are celebrities. 
So again, this is kind of controversial <coughs> because they shouldn't be like superstars or maybe yes, I don't know, but surely that has a very strong impact on uh, uh, beliefs uh, and also on the attitude and the inter interest of people towards religion. And I'm going to close with a purely positive example, not a controversial <laughs> one, because I'm after many popes we had that were mm, very, let's say, uh, all strict and rigorous. Now we have a pope, Pope Francis, uh, who has been recently defined the tweetable pope. Mm -hmm. That to me <laughs> is really like an example of a very good connection between between human and technology. He's a totally social media based pope, but he, and he uh, actually embodies uh, a spirit of humbleness and hu humorous approach to his office. He's very empathetic and he's famous for making home phone calls uh, to, to, to his worshippers in Italy whenever they ask him or they, well, I mean not all of them, when they write him <laughs> letters, uh, sometimes uh, asking for advice, asking for support, he calls them back at home. <laughs> so it's really, it's really, uh, it's really funny this, this thing uh, and he's teased for that but he's a very genuine guy beyond being <laughs> our pope. And also he relentlessly tweets on cogent secular aspects. So he does not, doesn't speak all, only about very high theological matters, <coughs> but he's really very down to earth. He talks about climate change, about refugee crisis, immigration, everything, and all that goes, and that is very cogent in, a, in the <coughs> social cultural life. And also he uses social media to reinforce the messages he spreads in his public offices. So he's very much aware of how transmedia environment works. Um, so basically it could be also an, an interesting example of how the church actually could and should change his, uh, its uh, attitude to storytelling to be, again, much more embedded in the fabric of social life that is going on today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> going to talk about video. <laughs> As you've heard, that's my... So, why video? Um, there's some statistics up there. Um, almost 80% of pe uh, people who watch video watch, um, who are on the internet are watching video. Five billion hours of YouTube videos are watched every single day. So, um, that's why video. We're going to assume that like a lot, a couple million are probably cat videos and babies and, you know, and, and people falling over, hitting themselves, but we're also going to assume that people are going there for content and that's kind of why we're here today. Um, so when you're thinking about video, about visual communication, the idea is that it tells a story. It's something that um, shows you something. So a lot of kind of historians and psychologists believe that storytelling is one of the ways we connect with each other. Um, it, divine, it defines our humanity. So. Um, what I wanted to show is like, you know, whether you've seen a, a wonderful TED talk or a moving sermon, the idea is, is that it's, it's what it teaches us, it helps us make sense of the world around us. So for example, in this quote, um, Don Hewitt, who's the creator of 60 Minutes, says, you know, pitch me a story. And somebody says, story's acid rain. And he's like, acid rain isn't a story, acid rain's a topic. <laughs> so it's like, tell me what, what's, what's the story, what somebody's been affected by it. And if we think about what's happened this last year, you know, with all the floods and the hurricanes and it's those images that are going to touch us. It's the, it's the person on the raft who's being saved in the flood. It's the guy in Santa Barbara who there's a fire and he's trying to save a bunny. I mean, it's like it's the different things that we look at and those are the ones we connect with because there's a, there feels like there's a story around it. So once again, just to kind of reiterate, it's stories need to have content and they need to have emotion. They need to tell us something and they need to move us. So that being said, as Diane had mentioned, I've been a video producer for uh, 18, 20 years, <laughs> and I've been here at USC for 10. And about six years ago, I ended up um, working with a former foster youth, and she just just it fell in love with her. She's just a great young woman, and I then ended up getting my master's degree and thought, well, what do I want to do? Did I want to teach? Did I want to mentor? I just didn't know, and I thought, well, I have these skills. What if I give foster youth the chance to kind of tell their stories, you know, to, you know, meet with me and we sit down for about however long, for about an hour, we do an interview and then um, we, we kind of put the story together. So you'll kind of see a clip of that in a minute. Um, but, let me see. So it's kind of the, you know, sorry. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is 
I'm kind of going back to Don Hill, but I wanted to give you some statistics. I don't know if anybody's aware of what's the foster care problem in the United States right now, but 58% don't even graduate high school. Three to 5% don't fit, are the only amount of finish a four-year college. We have the largest um, amount of foster care young people in Los Angeles County, in California. They're in, they're in uh, Los Angeles. Um, half of the youth who age out, they end up being incarcerated, they end up homeless, they end up, um, you know, part of sex trafficking. So it's like, how do we then, okay, so we have these statistics and they're overwhelming. So like I said, so what I try to do is think about how I can really tell the personal stories. So the next story, the story is gonna be about a young man named Javon. Um, most of these stories are three to five minutes. I edited this down just to a couple minutes just to give you an idea. I was born into kind of this, this chaos. As soon as I was born, drugs in my system, I went right into the foster care. I was always, you know, I guess you'd say announced as the special needs kind of behavioral problem kid. I was in and out of homelessness in middle school and in and out of homelessness beginning of high school. And so I basically said, okay, this is it, Javon. You're homeless. How are you gonna deal with this? And um, growing up in a home where you are labeled as Christian, you know, they say, well, you need to ask God to change you. And I remember one moment, I would pray all the time, I'd change. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not me. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can. Can you troubleshoot it? I was born into kind of this, this chaos. As soon as I was born, drugs in my system, I went right into the foster care. I was always, you know, I guess you'd say announced as the special needs kind of behavioral problem kid. I was in and out of homelessness in middle school and in and out of homelessness beginning of high school. And so I basically said, okay, this is it, Javon. You're homeless. How are you going to deal with this? And um, growing up in a home where you are labeled as Christian, you know, they say, well, you need to ask God to change you. And I remember one moment, I would pray all the time, like, change me, change me, but I still was doing like, the same thing. And uh, I just laid down on the floor in the hallway, and I remember it so vividly. And I said, well, God, why, why don't have you change me? Just having a conversation with me. And I said, well, I keep asking you to change me. And yet, I see nothing. And then, you know, when people say that aha moment, or you hear somebody speak, or you hear intervention, divine intervention. And I swore at that moment that, that I would, the answer came to me and said, well, what are you doing? you asking me to change you, but what are you doing? And so I went and talked to a psychiatrist, told her, like, I'm homeless. Um, you know, I've been living on the street for quite some time now. And she said, oh, we got to do something about this. And so she made it her mission to get me a, a, a bed to sleep in that night. So what I've kind of ended up doing, it's, it's been a kind of interesting ethnographic um, experiment because what happens is I've been doing these stories and it seems like there's always something you know like in the middle of their story they'll come a lot of the youth will come out of trauma and chaos and and then they're here and it's like how did you get here so a lot of the times I'll ask them you know what was there a term was there something in your life and some of the times it was a mentor the culture of a school it was a teacher and sometimes it was religion um, so I have another um, just this is a much shorter clip and I also have some cards there, so if you want to go on the site, you're welcome to look at these in, in, in full. But Casey started out, also went into foster care um, very young. She was adopted, and then she was taken out of her adoptive home, but didn't know why. Nobody told her, you know, until she was 18, until she aged out. But it was one of those ways she was recalling everything that happened between like 12 or 13 and 18. She goes, 
I remember, and I remember. So it ended up being, being this kind of poetic cadence. And I pulled the one clip where she was talking about her religious education. I thought it would be appropriate. <laughs> he went to church on Sundays, which was good. I like that. And, <coughs> but she really didn't want me to go to my own church. Like, she really wanted me to go to hers. <coughs> of normalcy that I had left from being taken away. I was very angry. <laughs> Anyways, like, she, she was angry. But, uh, but, but, you know, and how she, you know, and now she's, and both of these kids, he's married, she's actually engaged, she's got her bachelor's, she's getting her master's degree in a school in New Jersey. And so it's been kind of cool because I've actually stayed in touch with a lot of these kids after I've, um, you can go back to the thing. I don't need it. That's how I know if you want to. Um, so kind of what I'm saying is if you're thinking of storytelling as a journey, so how they get from where A is to where they are now, and how are these stories, but I'm thinking about, like, when you think about it for, how can you translate that to telling kinds of stories about religion? And I was thinking, you know, if it was me and I was telling those kind of stories, I would ask you, like, was there an aha moment or where you felt like you found God? Um, were, there, were you always religious? Or did something happen in your lives that turned you down that path? What is it like to pray? What does inner peace feel like? So I think there's a lot of ways to take the same kind of an idea of how we tell. Um, yeah, so you're good. Because I'm not going to play it. I mean, it's, okay. it's fine. It was almost over. Okay. Um, so how you, um, how you, I can't see how you, how you, um, how you tell these stories, so it could be told from, you know, obviously there's, there's stories in terms of New York, and, but I think that there's really a place to talk about religion in a story, obviously religion, storytelling is the way religion started, you know, with the Bible and how stories were told through the Bible, but I think that even now, I think if we found ways to tell, if we found ways to tell stories through video about what people's experiences were, it might be another way to kind of tie in and, and accelerate. So. Again, why video? We have a professor here. Um, he's a psychology and a neuroscience professor. And he says, we need emotion to make basically any kind of choice. So we're thinking again of how do you, um, first of all, it could be for marketing, for branding, but how do you get people involved and interested in what you're doing? And, and sometimes it's just that emotional connection. Um, finally, I wanted to go into outreach. So this is kind of what I've done. Um, I have a website, the Storyboard Project, where the videos play, and I also, have in integrated with, have worked with youth to, if they've written a book about foster youth, it could be on there. Some of them have written stories, it's on there. Some of them have written <coughs> blogs, I put them on there. So in terms of like transmedia, trying to bring multiple ways of how people are talking about this issue. Um, I also, the videos go on on Facebook, they go on on Twitter. On Facebook, I get a lot of, um, a lot of interaction. I mean, there's a lot of shares, there's tens of thousands of views and a lot of different agencies and a lot of people, and there's a lot of conversation around it. Like, oh, I was thinking I wanted to do this. You know, this was so, you know, you're hearing these little stories and it's like, or maybe it's just, maybe it's my way of saying, here's how you can be a good foster parent, <laughs> you know? Here, this is what changed this kid's life. Oh, if you're a teacher. So it's kind of my even undermined, underhanded way of saying, you know, look what could happen if you're, if you're able to be there for, one of, for a kid. Um, so, um, also, I got involved in the Chronicle of Social Change. It's a it's another way. So they're a um, online magazine. So I wrote blogs, and within the blogs, I put little video clips. So there's lots of I've worked with a number of different organizations. So there's lots of ways to take the content you have. You can repurpose the content. You can show it in whole. You can take little clips, um, and certainly in sermons, and and maybe even after a sermon, you could then take a little piece of it. So there's lots of ways to play with video to kind of continue that message and keep it going. And kind of as the end, you know, everybody has a story. So, um, and I thank you. So hopefully you got a taste of some of the best of um, what we do here in terms of social media, PR, and video. And so we have a little bit of time left. Do you have questions for the panel? Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for your, uh, for all of your presentations. It was all very interesting. Um, I myself am very interested in um, what uh, uh, an aspect of my research agenda called hashtag digital faith, which is similar, almost exactly what you guys are talking about, of looking at religious and spiritual development in digital spaces. 
Um, so can you all speak a little bit about, um, I mean, you all have started and, and shared great words, but can you speak a little bit more about the spaces in which you all have seen um, that have been created for religious and spiritual engagement? Like, there are examples of memes and things, but, but actual, like, spaces, or whether they be forum, forums or discussions, that the way that people are using the digital to create spaces for religious dialogue. Can you? Go ahead. Okay. Basically, um, in my view, what is going on today is really that, uh, I mean, spaces, uh, specific spaces are really not uh, the problem because uh, you can create conversations about religion, even starting from scratch, from totally different kind of discourse. So basically, the mobility that we have today of also of the digital spaces means that it can be, there can be new kind, new concepts of spaces that are not specifically like forums dedicated to talk about religion because that can get people discouraged to participate if you are not interested. Whereas uh, th there are uh, com spaces of conversation that actually generate, uh, in a, because we also we live in a very liquid society in which the kind of bonding is very, that pops up and then uh, it dissolves very rapidly. So the, ch the real challenge of using transmedia spaces also for religious discourse, for religious debates, m for me, is that uh, not uh, try to like categorize spaces as we used to do in the past, creating ad hoc spaces to generate conversations, but more getting embedded in a very subtle way, in a, like a very bottom-up kind of approach, and uh, like uh, in including religious debate in debates that maybe start from other reasons. Mm -hmm. And memes are a very good approach because you usually, you don't want to talk about religion really when you, you exchange memes, but then they pop up and then you start talking about that and it's very natural <coughs> and it's very embedded. So that's for me really what, what I don't know if it replies to your, but no, 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 in a no, certain no, sense. There, there, are, there, are a lot, there are scholars who do religion and media and religion online, and uh, as much as these women are all wonderful, that's not any of their actual specialties. If you're really interested, um, come grab me afterwards and I'll tell you what I know of who's doing work in that area. Yeah. yeah? I have a question for Laura. I found it very interesting in your presentation, you talked about having compelling visuals and then the next slide was <laughs> text. doing away, well not do not text, no, doing away with that user interface that I'm actually looking at something and I think about Alexa <coughs> or I think about those things and ironically I'm learning about those in a visual way as I see it in a commercial. Um, right. But having that compelling visual and then no user interface. Can you speak to that a little more? Sure, yeah. So basically the first three slides were like the now and then the last one was more like the future. And, and look, this zero UI thing may or may not end up being true in our lifetimes, right? Like we don't know for sure. But what I do know for sure is that there is a prevalence of, of chat, right? And chat is proliferating as a storytelling format in the text-based way. And I do think, and so what I, I'm, as I said, a trained writer. I'm not a trained visual storyteller. So that's something that seems right in my wheelhouse that I can experiment with in the writing and in the chat and that can possibly help us prepare for the zero UI future if it in fact is coming. But does that answer your question or? So I'm saying, I guess I'm saying now the compelling visuals are an important part of digital storytelling and then here's what I p see coming. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. which they would never do in person because they're hiding behind their screen or whatever it is. And so I'm, uh, is, that also true, is that also true in Italy and other places? I mean, what, I, what I seem to feel is that, and also post-election, that people have been emboldened to say whatever comes to their mind without any filter. So do you see, is that a trend you think will continue or do you think the, I, the notion of civility and rules for civility could actually prevail online? Is that, is that for me or? Any of you, you can, if you want to answer. You can go first. Oh, okay. Um, I think that uh, <coughs> you're, you're seeing the problem bubbling up, I think, a lot more post-election because of bots and, you know, the, and, you know, there's talk, I'm not, there's talk of, you know, because some of, because of Trump's rhetoric, it's, some of this is becoming normalized and proliferating even more online. So there's that. I don't personally study that. The only thing I would say is, you know, 
online discourse has been nasty for a long time, like places like Reddit and 4chan have been around for a long time and the, providing that anonymity I think does to a certain extent encourage that. But I, that's the only perspective I can offer in my expertise in that way. Yeah, I, or I can, I can add ahead. something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that um, this kind of incivility you're talking about will be a trend that will continue, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because online is going on everywhere, and it's some, it's really part of the I mean of the social behavior that uh, digital media are actually encouraging. Mm -hmm. Also, because you use avatars, it just takes uh, just a very few moments just to text something nasty, and you hide a little bit behind the screen in a certain sense. Okay that you wouldn't do in person. So that, that is going on, and that is a drawback, of course, of social media. But on the other standpoint, uh, you can, as a matter of fact, I also selected uh, the memes that I propose to you that are very nasty memes uh, that I, of course, if you go online, you find. So, of course, there is a lot of bad things going on there in social media happening. But on the other side, uh, it's something that is, that is there. We must confront with it, uh, and we must take the best out of it uh, in order to see how it is possible to change uh, also for very rigorous institutions like the religions ones, because otherwise, if you stay out of this discourse, you're going to lose faith, you're going to lose the, the connection with people, and that is even worse. So it's kind of a compromise, and now there are no institutions for me that can't, can't do without doing compromise. And so this is, this is the problem. You have to, be, to select only the best and try to educate the more you can. But Susie, I'm just recording. Wait, can, I, can I move on? Because a lot of people have questions. Um, yes? So a question for Rosella. Where did your information on moralistic deism come from? It's about uh, this uh, study that has been conducted by this professor, this researcher, uh, Christian Smith of University of Northern Carolina. He's actually and in Notre Dame now. It's He's at Notre Dame now. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he conducted this research uh, that it was also reported on a, in a reportage of the BBC about this kind of a secular, secularized credo which applies to Christianity. And uh, I'm not, I chose to use this, uh, the, this name because I found uh, that the name was uh, very adequate to describe, but I mean the concept that, stand, that is behind is the secularized credo. So we could use also other terms. I wanted to use one that was introduced by a, a study, by a research study that was mentioned also from the BBC because I found that it was more, uh, let's say, adequate to call it in this way. But it's uh, the, the most important things are the, the ones uh, concerning uh, this aspect of uh, this belief which is more uh, pragmatic and more down to earth and more uh, related not to fate in uh, afterlife but to uh, improve current life. So that is that is the concept that really intrigues me, and as a Catholic also. Yes. Okay, in the back. Yeah. Um, I just have for Laura. When when big organizations hire like a new team for Snapchat or Instagram focus, what do you think makes the best candidate for that position? Okay, you can ask her that later. Okay. No, because let's try to focus on questions that have to do with the panel. Yeah, I was just saying what makes you good at that type of storytelling. Um, well, yeah, we can, I, I'm happy, I'll be here after, I work here, so we can talk after a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, when uh, you were speaking, Laura, um, your presentation evoked for me, um, you know, something way back, like the medium is the mes message, and uh, Marshall McLuhan. There's so many um, formats today in terms of storytelling that, you know, you, you'd have to be so adept at understanding like how to tell your story within that format. And so uh, I think the challenge for any of us you know, who are trying to tell a faith story, spiritual stories, is um, well, who, who's gonna spend the time to get skilled in these formats? You know, we're used to writing or you know, a visual story. Um, um, and with the new organizations that do this, and it seems like they, they're, they're putting so much energy in um, types of formats, and, and you have to have specialties and all these things. I mean, what's some reflection on like what this, you know? Where are um, ordinary people getting their stories? You know, how does how does that get developed so that you have impact from us telling you know stories from a literary a literate a literary sense of writing, and then to translate this into these media, the media. Right, so um, I think that what you, what, there, you're right, you're absolutely right. There's sort of more to do, right? And it's a problem for newsrooms. 
Um, and what I would recommend is that you try to find, um, figure out, you know, where your audience is either already engaging with you and how, or, um, or where there's potential for that, whether you find that, you know, people like to consume story, religious stories on Facebook or Twitter or wherever it may be, and try to build a presence there. So it's not that you have to do everything, but that you try to focus on where you think you can really build an audience and you try to focus on growing a specific audience. Is that helpful to you? That is helpful. Okay. I'm going to add on to that if you don't mind. And I also think that you have to think about what it is you end up wanting to say. Like what, what is it that you want the audience to walk away from? Is it join, you know, we want you to come to services. We want you to pray, what, you know, whatever that idea is. So you find your stories based on what it is you want your audience to be, not to be hearing, but the idea, like the cell, like what is it you want for them to know by these stories? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. We have time for one more, yeah? Um, hi. So one thing that really strikes me is the language that you're using. What do you want to sell? What do you want your audience to consume? So we have audience, we have sellers, we have marketers. And you know, when I think about religion, I think about community, I think about constructing an embrace, you know, of, of, a, of a number of people. It's sort of the exact, I'm sorry? It, yeah, it's sort of the exact opposite of consuming um, or marketing something. So it's, it's, it's actually quite striking, you know, it's kind of like what my colleague um, at, at Harvard, Marshall Gantz, calls like the gloss from without or the glow from within. Which way are we going? Well, yeah. Is this for me? I don't know. I, I really, I really, I was just saying because everybody used that kind of language well, and it's really striking. Something that actually on one of Roselle's slides that struck me that I was like, I wish I said that, um, is she it said something along the lines of um, digital is dialogue, digital communication is dialogue, yeah. okay. and you know I I didn't put that in this presentation, but I teach that in that two way commun it's more um, storytelling on digital is a lot about two-way communication in some cases, right? You saw some examples that showed that and some that didn't so much the longer form narrative, for example, which again, still a great storytelling technique online, right? So I teach conversational writing and I, you know, I teach all this because I, and I say to my students, you know, um, it's a lot more about, you know, a, a, imitating a one-to-one -one conversation versus one-to-many, right? I think d digital storytelling has that element to it. And then another point on top of that is, um, if you're looking at like larger trends, like the way Facebook has made these like crazy changes to its algorithm lately that has the news industry all up in arms, right? And one of the things that Facebook is trying to do is build, um, is focus on groups and those communities. So you are, and so and like at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, a lot of trends of online storytelling are driven by Facebook's whims and desires. And if they're emphasizing groups, you'll probably see more uh, effort to do community building by organizations that you know are primarily in the storytelling business if that makes sense yeah, yeah. And if i can just a few seconds uh, um it's also you were perfectly right uh, and i can since i work more in the marketing and consumption field i can say that actually is marketing and consumption that is going towards the concept of community it's not anymore about selling because this is also rejected from consumers yeah. Because there is a long, a very strong debate uh, in consumption culture now to call individuals consumers because we produce much more than we consume. Mm -hmm. And we self-present and we build our own identity and we don't want to buy products that we don't need. Yeah. We buy ideas. That's what we want our, institu our brands now since institutions are having crisis in the, and they're melting down like Bauman said. We expect from brands actually to take the role of the institutions, of the political institutions also as super citizens and dictate the agenda, then do the agenda setting for people. So we, we, we buy products if we think that the companies are ethical, if they are societal. Mm -hmm. So that's like a, this kind of dialogue which is not possible between, usually it wasn't possible, community on the marketing on the other side, is getting more combined because there are consumers that are not consumers anymore. So that's remains the that, that that's something that is going on. I don't know if thank you. Have. This was a great panel.